Abraham's story has been showing us something about faith and about how even when our faith has its ups and downs, that God is constant, that that God is patient, that God is merciful, that God is gracious, that that God won't let our times of faithlessness uh, cancel his faithfulness. In fact, what we find is that God wants our faith to grow in those challenging times. And that's been happening in Abraham's life. Um, His faith isn't perfect by any means. I mean, Abraham's faith still has some ups and downs, but his faith has also grown. And one of the things that's a sign of a growing and developing faith is, is the way that you see Abraham talking to God. In church language, we'd call that prayer. Now, prayer can take a lot of different forms. You might have memorized some prayers, like the Lord's Prayer or some before meal prayers. You might read prayers from a devotion book or from that you version verse of the day, prayer of the day part. You might have a form that helps you, well, think about things to pray for, like the teaspoon prayer that um, Alex, our family minister here at Concordia, has been teaching us. Thanks, uh, sorry, and and please. Uh, Some of your prayer might be a simple cry for, well, help. But but whatever form it takes, prayer in in its simplest, you could say, is just simply talking with God. Prayer's talking to God, and you know what? We can all do that. We can all have these conversations with God about whatever. And and that sort of an active prayer life, like I said, is a sign of a growing faith. Not a perfect faith, but a growing one. And that's kind of what you see in this section of Abraham's story. So we're going to dig into this short section and, and find out, as Abraham's faith has been growing, What are some things that this short little section in Genesis chapter 18 shows us about um, prayer? The Lord also said, Sodom and Gomorrah have many complaints against them, and their sin is very serious. I must go down and see whether these complaints are true. If not, I will know it. From there, the men turned and went on towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing in front of the Lord. Abraham came closer and asked, Are you really going to sweep away the innocent with the guilty? What if there are 50 innocent people in the city? Are you really going to sweep them away? Won't you spare that place for the sake of the 50 innocent people who are in it? It would be unthinkable for you to do such a thing, to treat the innocent and the guilty alike and to kill the innocent with the guilty. That would be unthinkable. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is fair? The Lord said, if I find 50 innocent people inside the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham asked, Consider now, if I may be so bold as to ask you, although I am only dust and ashes, what if there are 45 innocent people? Will you destroy the whole city because of five fewer people? The Lord answered, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Abraham asked him again, What if 40 are found there? He answered, For the sake of the 40, I will not do it. Please don't be angry if I speak again, Abraham said. What if 30 are found there? He answered, If I find 30 there, I will not do it. Look now, if I may be so bold as to ask you, Abraham said, what if 20 are found there? He answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Please don't be angry if I speak only one more time, Abraham said. What if 10 are found there? He answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. When the Lord finished speaking to Abraham, he left. Abraham returned home. Well, as I read through that section here of of Abraham talking with God, the first thing that jumps out to me about prayer is that prayer is personal, right? That it flows out of the relationship that you have. I mean, to me, as I read through this, it's fairly obvious that Abraham sees God as something more than just uh, an an impersonal and all-powerful force because Abraham here is, is talking with God just like you and I might talk with somebody that we know pretty well. And I think maybe that's the point. That prayer 
flows from our relationship. And it is out of that personal relationship that Abraham makes these bold requests to God. You see, when you see that prayer flows from the relationship, then you start to understand that Abraham here isn't, he's not haggling with God. He's not bargaining for Sodom like you might try to get the best price on a new car. What Abraham's doing here is, well, he's come to know God really well. He's come to know God really well, and so what he's appealing to here is God's nature and God's character. Because Abraham, through time, has come to know God as, well, through his own second chances that he's gotten multiple times, he's come to know God as gracious and compassionate and, and slow to anger and abounding in, in steadfast love. And it's on that basis, because that's what he's experienced in God, that he, he talks to God uh, for the people of, of Sodom. Now, how did Abraham get to know God like that? I mean, how can you get to know God in this personal way rather than just kind of as some idea or, or, or force out there? Well, the same way you get to know anyone else. Time. So Abraham got to know God like this by spending time with God. I, I mean, think about it, that. Is, isn't that how relationships work? The more time that you spend with your friends, the more time you spend dating someone, the more time you spend married to someone, well, the more you know about them. And the more comfortable you feel sharing all sorts of stuff and talking about things on a, even on a very personal level. And you can do the same thing with God. You can do the same thing with God. You can get so personal with God that, that you can talk with him uh, in your prayer life ab about whatever's on your mind and, and see that not as some sort of just a, a duty or a religious obligation or a, or a have to, but like you're, you're talking to someone that you know really well and, and that you trust a whole lot. But the only way to get to, to that sort of level with God is to spend time with him. And, and both quality and quantity time. I mean, here's what I've learned from being a parent. You really want those quality time moments with your kids, but you usually can't script those quality time moments and, and squeeze them into some nice, efficient, scheduled quality time box. Like, we're gonna have quality time in these moments. For me, those, those quality time moments, they, they came, they came a lot, but they, they seemed to flow out of me just spending time with my kids. And I, and I think it's the same way with God here. It, those quality moments flow out of our spending some consistent quantity time with God. That suggests to me if, if you want to develop that, that vibrant prayer life and relationship that, that comes from a, in a growing faith, th that you got to put in the time. you got to put in the time with God on a regular basis. Now, how do you do that? Well, well that might vary. We probably all got different ways that we spend time with God, but there's no shortcut to putting in the time and, and to doing it consistently. See, because those, those quality moments in those faith-growing times, they don't come from, from scripting God. They come from seeking God. So the more time you spend with God, the more you, you start to understand God's heart and God's character. And the more you understand God's heart and God's character, the more you see that, that God is gracious. And that he's gracious 
even when you don't really want them to be. Uh, and that, to me, is the stretching part of this particular scene. Because as I read that again, who's Abraham praying for here? Right? Abraham's praying for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, he's praying for people who are doing some really bad stuff. Praying for people who are doing some wicked stuff, some evil stuff. Praying for people who are living for themselves and making the mess of other people's lives and trampling all over what God says is right. And I think Abraham's quite aware of what's going on down there in Sodom. And, and he knows the things that they've done and he knows the kind of people that they are. And still, Abraham prays here for the people of Sodom. Now, that's stretching to me because for me, sometimes when I look at, at the world and, and I see all the, some of the evil and the bad out there, I might be praying, God, punish them. God, uh, destroy them, wipe them out, or, or at least just like get rid of all this bad, punish them, keep the good. Um, and Abraham could have prayed that. I mean, and, and God could have done that. He's almighty God. He can do anything. He could have created some little, like, bubble to keep any of the righteous, say, Lot and his family safe, and then rain down fire and brimstone and destroyed everything, but kept them safe inside that bubble. But Abraham doesn't pray for that. Abraham, instead, well, Abraham is a, a person who's received mercy himself, and now he prays for mercy for others. And, and Abraham here prays, God, God, spare the wicked for the sake of the righteous. Right? Spare the wicked, God, for the sake of the righteous. Um, which really makes me stop and think here that, that part of Abraham's story is also showing me, me this. You can pray for people that you don't like or that you disagree with. I mean, that's stretching, isn't it? You can pray for people that you don't like or that you disagree with. I mean, you can pray for grace to grow in our world. You can pray for, for time that those that you consider the evil ones would actually have time to be influenced by the righteous, that they turn their hearts away from their evil ways to God. That, that's what God wants. The Bible says God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you can also pray for our government and for our leaders, and get this, for, for government and leaders of a different political persuasion than, than you and of a different worldview than, than you have, and, and, and you can do that for the sake of those who are impacted by their judgments and by their decisions. Remember, Abraham here is, isn't praying for Sodom and Gomorrah just for themselves. He's praying for Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of, of the righteous. Because he doesn't want the righteous to be destroyed along with the wicked there. So when you're praying for those who of a different political persuasion, for those that you disagree with, uh, you, you're, for when you're praying for government, what, what you're praying for there in a way is you're praying that your community would be a better place. And, and then because you're in it, you'll be blessed too. Right? So I think maybe part of this section, as stretching as it is, is a little bit of a a model, as it were, for, for praying in, in a sinful world. I mean, I think what it's telling here, at least it's what it's telling me is, I, I, pray, I, I can be praying for our, our messed up, sinful world. And that I can be praying for those that I disagree with. Even for those who are uh, making life more than a little difficult, or their decisions are making life more than a little difficult, or they're making it difficult to stand up and be counted as a follower of Jesus, I can be praying for them and, and should be praying for them. I can be praying for those who are trampling all over God's will and in God's ways. I, I can be praying 
that the righteous would actually influence the, the evil so that they turn back to God. And as I do that, I can be praying with a confidence that, that God, who is both gracious and just, will ultimately act in the way that's best. Now for me, thinking through that was really challenging and, and stretching. But I think in the world that we live in, it's also really essential that we devote ourselves to that task. Even praying for those that we don't like and that we disagree with. So think about this for a moment. Who, who right now don't you like or do you disagree with that, that you're challenged to pray for in, in the world around you right now? Just, just think about them and, and, and write it down and then pray for them right in this moment so, so you don't forget. And, and if, it, if you're challenged, like maybe I am sometimes, to like, how do I do that? Well, well here's some things to kind of guide your thoughts. Dear God, our hearts are broken for this world. The hatred is palpable, the division undeniable, and the pain runs deep. We desperately need more of you. We ask for your truth to be louder than the noise which surrounds us, for your mercy to be stronger than the voices of oppression, for your strength to overpower those who seek to do harm. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is anger, bring peace. Where there is evil, bring victory. Empower us to fulfill your mission, to answer your calling, to be the light you've created us to be. May your love, your grace, and your mercy flood this world. We love you, we seek you. We place our hope in the mighty name of Jesus. This we pray. So, Abraham prays from his relationship with God. And because Abraham both knows God's heart and he trusts God's judgment, Abraham here can even pray for those that he disagrees with. Not, not just for their sake, but for the sake of those who are following God but are stuck in a, in a messed up world. Now, now, those are some pretty important things about prayer that I learned from this section, I think. But there's a few more things that I notice here. As I read that through a third time, I, I notice that Abraham here is kind of feeling his way forward. But he's feeling his way forward in a spirit of, of faith. Right? What about... 50. What about 45? What about 40? 30? 20? 10? Now here again, he's, Abraham's not haggling. He's asking. He's, he's exploring. He's like, God, is it, is it possible? God, would you? God, could you? I mean, Abraham didn't know what God would do for sure, and so, so he probed, he, he pleaded, he, he explored. He, he was boldly checking out what God's will might be. And I think he's showing us that, well, you can do the same thing. Like Luther said, uh, as we can with all boldly and confidently, as dear children, ask their dear father. And so when we're talking to God about this stuff that's on our heart, we, we can ask God, would you grant that miracle? Would you give me that miracle of healing? God, would you, would you, send, would you send rain to water our land in this time of drought? God, God, would you help me here? Would you take care of my family there? God, God, would you provide me with my desire for this thing? God, would you, would you make this sickness go away? Would you, would you make this pain go away? God, would you give me clarity in this decision? God, would you 
provide uh, for our church. And, and on and on and on and on. God, these are our needs, our, our wants, our, our desires. But Father, what's your will here? What's your will? We, we don't know, and, and so we're, we're just asking. We're, we're feeling our way forward, but feeling our way forward in faith. Constantly asking, God, will you? And doing it like the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray constantly. Just out of relationship and in that relationship, just kind of feeling our way forward in faith and exploring these bounds of God's will and then doing it persistently. I mean, that's another thing I notice here in Abram's prayer. It's persistent. That whole 50, 45, uh, 30, 20, 10, it, it kind of reminds me of a little kid coming to their parent for something. They, they just keep asking and asking and asking, uh, going to their parent for what they want because they know, well, if they're going to get what they want, they're going to get it from their parent. And I think uh, the point here is that, that prayer just keeps asking. It keeps asking God because it, it, this the relationship you had with God understands that God's really the only place to go for, for what you want, for what you desire. The big things... The, the small things, and everything in between. God's the one we look to for everything. And, and perhaps, as I look at this section, I think that persistence, it's also God's way of maybe teaching us a little bit of patience and also cultivating attitudes of, of humility and trust in us. I mean, look back at Abraham again. I'm going to read verse 22 to you. Abraham says, Now that I have been so bold to speak to the Lord, though I am but dust and ashes. See, see that dust and ashes? It's, it's showing a humility that recognizes his position in the relationship. Right? It, it, it's so close and personal that, that Abraham can talk to God like, like we talk to each other. But... Even at that, it's not an equal relationship. And Abraham recognizes that. Right? God is God, and Abraham is human. He's dust and ashes. And that's not on the same level. I mean, and so while Abraham can explore uh, the bounds of God's will and persistently ask and probe his will, he also realizes here he doesn't have rights to make demands of God. Um, other than to ask God to keep the promises that he's already made. Um, so, so Abraham approaches God with, with this humbleness of, of heart and, and a recognition that God, being God, can, can do what he wants. But Abraham has this, this humble faith and, and what I'd call a sincere trust that God, in his grace and mercy, uh, because he's both gracious and, and just, he's ultimately going to do what's best. And that's the promise of prayer. See, the promise of prayer is not that you're going to get everything that you want. Abraham's prayer actually didn't end up saving Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and, and that might be how it is with your prayers too. I mean, when you pray like Abraham did, Boldly, out, out of your relationship and boldly and persistently lay your needs before God. Lay your heart in front of him. You, you can ask him anything and talk to him about everything knowing that, that God is good and, and that God is gracious and that God's able to do what you ask. Well, you might get what you ask for and you might not. But... The promise of prayer isn't that you're going to get everything that you want. Okay, what I learned from this story of Abraham here is that the promise of prayer is that as you approach God in prayer, that God's going to listen. And, and that as you boldly and pres, uh, persistently, as you boldly and persistently explore the, the bounds of his will, that, that God's not going to turn you away. And that through that sort of 
questioning and probing and exploring and, and, and talking that your own faith in God, it, it can grow. It, it's going to grow. And you're going to develop a, a relationship with God that's, that's at a deeper level than, than you've had before. And as your faith grows to, to that point, you, you, can even, you can even pray for those that you disagree with. You can even pray for those that you don't like. And you know what? God's going to hear that prayer too. And, and God, your Heavenly Father, you can trust that He's going to do what's best. Because being a good and gracious Father, that's the only thing He can do.